All right, so the concept for today's episode is kind of inspired by the fact that I'm going through a life-changing moment tomorrow. Uh, I'm getting married. Well, okay, tomorrow as of when this podcast episode comes out. Yeah, yeah. to, to the audience. To the audience. To, tomorrow, yeah. Yes, We're recording yeah. this early because I'm Got going it. into a quarantine uh, before I, uh, I have this backyard wedding, but um, it's kind of inspired by that. I've been doing a lot of thinking about that and primarily thinking about the concept of being an old YouTuber. Uh, I think it's really interesting to be, you know, both of us are 31 years old. Um, we're like career creators. And you start to think as you get to this point of being a creator of like, when does, do, what do I, how does this work? Like, do I just keep making videos? How, how does this go? And I thought, you know, even deeper starting to look at a lot of what we've been talking about is creators who are launching brands and creators who are um, developing things that are, you know, bigger than themselves. But at the same time, there's a lot of other creators online who, who do still create uh, into their, you know, older age. And so I thought it was an interesting thing to talk about because we are both getting a little bit older of like, do you see yourself becoming an older YouTuber? I don't know if I think about it in terms of being a YouTuber. I think about it in terms of someone who makes video and is on mm. camera. Uh, I, I, sometimes I forget that I'm a YouTuber. I think there's a, I think the distinction there though, the reason I make the distinction and say YouTuber is because to be a YouTuber, you have to play the YouTube game. Like it's not actually about being a really, it is about being a really good storyteller, about being able to make good videos. But additionally, it's about like mo almost more importantly, if your income is attached to YouTube views, it's about playing into the YouTube algorithm. And like the thing that's that's interesting is like as years have gone by, what I find is fascinating is like you have to adjust yourself to the algorithm. Like your creative is playing a dance between what audiences want to watch, what you want to make, and what the algorithm is interested in feeding to people. And that's why I think I made the distinction between YouTuber and like filmmaker or creator. Yeah, I definitely don't think I want to be at the mercy of the YouTube algorithm <laughs> for my livelihood. Right. You know, ever actually. Yeah, ever. I think that's the important thing is like ever. Ever, yeah. No, that's not, and, I don't think that's desirable at all. So I was listening to um, Zayn Hajazi and Heath. They have a podcast called Unfiltered. Um, there are two members of the vlog squad and they were talking about um, this concept of second channels. And I thought it was re really interesting because we are currently on our second channel right now. And we have uploaded more to this channel than our main channel recently. Um, and a lot of that is because this is a podcast channel. The nature of this is totally different than what we make on our main channel. Um, we also don't have any obligations on this channel. There's no sponsorships. There's nothing that has to be made. There's nothing that has to come out. So I think there's something really interesting that happens over time when you, when you make the thing that you do for fun into your job. And that means when it's your job as a creator, you have to find basically the product market fit right? Like you have to find the thing that works, the thing that works again for the audience, for you and for the algorithm. But that requires changing yourself. A little bit. Yeah. Right? I mean, I think the people are lucky who are able to find the exact thing that they want that YouTube loves and that audiences love. Um, and it's not to say like, we don't like what we make on our main channel. I love what we make. I think every time we press publish on those videos, it's super fun. I love it. And I think it's really cool. Um, but it is tied directly to the way that our business makes money now is making those videos. And that changes the relationship a bit. And I think that's why a lot of creators end up making second channels because they build themselves, basically uh, they build themselves like a world and a box that they have to fit into because audiences want that. And audiences are fairly unforgiving about you changing your styles. And YouTube is unforgiving. Yeah, we about talked it. about this earlier. It's not always audiences. I think a lot of audiences putting myself in the shoes of an audience member for a lot of YouTube creators, I'm actually pretty open to change. I kind of enjoy seeing Casey Neistat's channel change throughout the years, going into multiple seasons of the vlog and, and trying out different formats. Um, but it's really the YouTube algorithm that requires change or lack thereof, actually. Yeah, lack of change. It, it, it requires both. You have to catch up with it and you have to stay on it at the yeah. same time. Yeah. Like. That's the interesting part. So I think that feels so exhausting to me when I think 10 years out or 12 years out. 
where I'm like, I'm even if I'm creatively fulfilled, it doesn't necessarily mean that I'm hitting the quantity of views required to make it a living, a living. Yeah. You actually, you have to be willing to play the game. And I think that's as, as I'm entering into this next phase of life and just looking at the landscape, you know, what's really important is to start moving into those other forms of business because of the nature of YouTube. I think also both of us have a desire for video not to be the final and only product right. that we sell. Our background with the lacrosse network was not, yeah, it was of course about video, but we weren't really selling video. And uh, you know, we were at a, to an extent, but we were building a whole brand, a whole network, a whole company. But we never and, sold anything different. Yeah, but it, it didn't rely on every video being you and I in it, you and I making it. That's the difference. Yeah, we, we built a sub like a d separate brand from ourselves. Yeah, so we, I think, were, we were Colin and Samir from the lacrosse network at all times. And people would ask us, how'd you get a job there? Right. It's yeah, different yeah. dynamic than like, this is the Colin and Samir personal channel mm -hmm. where of course you're only going to get Colin and Samir. Even speaking about it like that in the third person is weird. <laughs> yeah, it's funny to speak about it like that. So yeah, I think it's a, it's a really interesting career choice and path. Um, because again, it's not exactly like being talent where you do a thing really well and you get paid to do that thing. It's not exactly that, that's part of it. Then there's the other element, which is like, you're good at telling stories and you can craft a really good video. That's another part of it. And then the, the third part, which has to come all together is, and you deeply understand YouTube, how it works. And now you, you sprinkle in a little, you have to be an incredible graphic designer. You have to be good at writing uh, copy and writing really good headlines. You have to be really good at uh, engaging with the community, uh, building a brand, building consistencies across that brand. The people who have done it for like 10 years successfully, the people who have done it who just don't, you know, fall off are so impressive to me. And YouTube loves a lot of these creators, as do I. I think uh, one of them being Casey Neistat. I think today we talked about it. He hasn't uploaded in a while. It's on the trending page today with just like a really cool day in the life vlog. <laughs> That's yeah. That if anyone else made it, wouldn't yeah. end up on the trending page. He's in such a unique situation because I, Casey's 39 years old. The interesting thing about Casey is that he didn't actually achieve true YouTube success until his mid thirties. And he went so hard for like two and a half, three years. But still at the same time, the important thing to recognize is still his, his, his big kind of business move was a company that wasn't his YouTube channel that was basically powered by his YouTube channel. So that was Beam News and, and Beam. And eventually sold to CNN. Yeah, for 25 million bucks. So like that is a really interesting element that I think what you're noticing in, in the world of, if you are gonna do this in the long term, you have to be building something side by side with it. It has to be, you know, the, what Emma Chamberlain is doing now with the planner and the coffee and the, um, you know, what, what Logan Paul is doing with Maverick which I don't know if that can exist without him, but you know, stuff, things like that, that are brands that are, that are sustainable outside. The, there's an interesting other comp, like well, well, part of the vlog squad is uh, Jason Nash. And I watched Jason Nash and I, I think about, you know, he, he talks about it on, on David's podcast quite a bit around his need to create vlogs, right? It's, it is, he's got a family, he's got, you know, mortgage, he's got, he has to make those vlogs. Uh, now, does he enjoy them? I don't know, probably. Uh, he probably enjoys like having fun making those vlogs, but there's a level of pressure that um, that comes with this, that comes with uh, what, what Zane and Heath said on their podcast was um, you, f you start to feel like the audience becomes your boss. That is such an interesting dynamic that's so different from any other creative endeavor. You know, like, I don't, I don't know that maybe, maybe an actor feels like that. Maybe a musician feels like that, but I'm not positive. There's so many other factors at play of how you can, uh, you know, monetize. So when you look ahead, how many years do you see yourself being in YouTube videos? Well, I think this is one of the most important things we've done because this has, this has felt like it's brought me a level of freedom that I've been, uh, that I've been craving, like a level of liberation where I'm like, oh, this, this is, this is so fun. This is making a YouTube video. It's, it's using a platform that I'm diehard passionate about. I, I can't imagine a world where I'm not a part of YouTube or uploading something to YouTube 
I mean, for the foreseeable future, honestly, for the next 10, 20 years. Um, making videos in this, that are chasing the algorithm uh, and trying to you know, get as many views as possible. That I think is something that's uh, like a, that's just like a, a rapidly moving, what are those sand things? Hourglass, like where it's just like, yeah, yeah, I'm like, watching you feel it. feel like, like time is running out. Yeah, where I'm just like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like that is not the same. Making YouTube videos is really fun, but having them be the sole driver of income, I think that's also where you're, where you get creator burnout. Mm -hmm. um, because it's just like, you have no other choice. You Don't have to make this video. You know, and yeah, that I mean, is a different relationship with your creative process than I get to make this video. I think that's how we currently feel. Not not that we don't like the videos we have coming down the pipe, but we do have six videos that like are at varying levels of completion just because they all came at once. Yeah. So we're staring at, you know, then, a bunch of good videos that will come out. But yeah, when you're looking at six, it's like, oh man, this is this is really difficult to wrap my head around six different titles and thumbnails, like six different intricate edits. Mm -hmm. It's just intense. Yeah, and then additionally, the reason it can't really be scaled is because to a certain extent, there's you can get help. You know, people can come on and, and support on the post-production side, but there is a specific style that you've created that is what your audience is expecting. And again, also what, you know, is gonna keep the channel growing and what's gonna keep views growing. And, um, you know, that's that's the touch that you have to put on it to make it work. So yeah, I think yeah. what I would what, recommend. What about you though? I'm, I'm curious in, in your perspective because you you take on more of the the post side of what we do. Like, wh how long do you see yourself doing? Um, I don't know. I mean, there are times when I mean, in the beginning of, or end of last year, we were essentially walking away, and I was going to live in Philadelphia, and we were going to make far less YouTube videos. We we're still going to make videos, but just like you know, when we could here and there, we didn't really have that many videos planned. So. I, I think I easily like could see myself going totally like cold turkey, I guess I'll call it in terms of like not being in YouTube videos, but I always need to be making something. Like I do enjoy the aspect of, of looking at videos as like a film and as a project and taking them from an idea to completion. Yeah, like that, yeah. I, I just think is so enjoyable. And I do like even the intangible part of editing that I can't always explain. Like there are things that I'll do in the edit where I'm like, ah, I could have never imagined that I would have tried this this time, but I really like the way that turned out. It's like speaking, learning to speak a different language. Like you're, you're you keep adding to your uh, vocabulary, I feel like. And that's really enjoyable. That, like that process over the last eight years, I've added it to my, I've added to my editing vocabulary. Yeah. And that's really enjoyable. And I think I'll do that forever, but I, I don't, feel a huge need to be on camera. I love being on camera when we're just having a good time and like we're joking yeah. around. Like that's super fun. It's pretty fun to be on camera for an experiential thing, like going somewhere, going on a trip because you're getting to enjoy the trip. So I don't know. I think it's give and take. Like there are things about it that I definitely don't look forward to and that I don't want to be a part of my life. Like, you know, heavy editing hours and feeling like, man, I just have to do this. Like, did I create a job that I don't want? Yeah. You know, like that, that's, that's where I, I get concerned. Um, but as long as like I'm having a good time and my passion is there for what I'm building, then I'm not too concerned. Like, yeah. I think that's one of the biggest takeaways uh, for anyone who's listening to this who maybe is a creator or, or wants to become a creator or is in a creative space. Like, you know, the, the thing that's important is as a creative person, you're going to evolve like as what your desires are, what you're inspired by. Like I'm inspired by completely different things this month than I was two months ago. Um, and being a YouTube creator, you do, you are making a product a lot of times, especially if that is your directly monetizable thing that you're doing. The thing that you are monetizing is the videos. Then almost agnostic of where your inspiration is, you do have to kind of hit a certain mark on those videos uh, if those are your primary income source. So if you are the type of creative who wants to do many different things, the important thing is to build systems and build a business that is connected to you making videos, but not reliant on you making videos. That's like, and that could be merchandise, right? That could be apparel, that could be a clothing brand where it's like, 
yeah, if this video gets 100,000 views, that's cool. If we get a million views, even better, more people know about my clothing line. And if it gets 4,000 views, that's all right too, because those 4,000 people now know about my clothing line. So like if you build that uh, into what you do, you can evolve quite a bit as an artist. And I think it's natural for anyone who's creative to evolve over time. And the, the, the reason why this whole thing gets scary and the reason why the burnout happens is because the algorithm doesn't want you to evolve. Uh, when it's not ready for you to evolve. Yeah, it just wants you to find what works and then keep doing what works three times a week. Yeah, exactly. And for us, what works takes a really long time. (laughs) Yeah, it takes a long time to make it. And I think, again, it's that the three three parts of the puzzle where it's like what works, what the audience is interested in, and what we like to make. Those are the three parts of the puzzle. So yeah, I I think it's it's just like any career. There's, There's times where you have to evaluate like, how how does this all play out? Like, how long does this, is this a lifetime? And I think there's a lot of creators who are like, this is my life. This is the rest of my life. I'll make these videos, you know? But I think I've just been listening to a lot more of that type of stuff and thinking a lot more about it around um, which parts of this, you know? I think YouTube as an engine is one of my favorite things in the world. Like, I think it's one of the most impressive uh, coolest things to build a community on YouTube and then, you know, be able to build something alongside it. That to me is one of the coolest things in the world. And I, I, I want to do that for the remainder of my life. What I find that's really enjoyable about YouTube right now is that it helps you travel the world, even though you can't go anywhere. Mm. Like we put out that podcast with Eric on this channel, a channel that at the time had 2000 subscribers. I think we have close to four or five now at 2000 subscribers. And that video has 75, 80,000 views. Tons of people have seen it all over the world. Yeah, that's super cool. Like what an interesting dynamic thing that at a time when you can't go anywhere, you can upload to this platform and it can just travel. That is something I could see myself doing for the next 30 years of my life, interviewing creators. Yeah, that's really Interviewing artists and creators is one of my favorite things in the world to do. Yeah, it's just enjoyable whether you're recording or not. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Like sitting down and having a conversation with someone who is doing something that's creatively fulfilling to them or like inspiring or... um, someone who's doing something that feels impossible and just like expressing themselves that to me, having that conversation, I could do that forever. Yeah. What I like about that too, is that, you know, it's enjoyable to consume with minimal editing. Yeah. You know, and that's really cool. Like it's, it's enjoyable with minimal editing. That's actually one of the best ways to showcase that format Mm -hmm. is to just let it be an hour and a half long. What does your ideal day look like? Um, I think it's, a mix of spending my time in the content space, in the digital space, um, which would mean editing, sending out tweets, things like that. But a lot of it, I think I would prefer to be outside of it. I think I'd like that to be like less than 50%. And I would really like the rest of the time to be involved with building some sort of tangible product or company like a good, something Mm -hmm. that can be really like held on to. You know, I think I've spent so much time in like the digital space. And I think about the lacrosse network, it was so hard to really like grab hold of. It was understandable, but it was not, you couldn't really, you could wear a lacrosse network shirt, but like the product wasn't really, I don't know, like a consumer good. Mm -hmm. And I, I think when we spent time on this YouTube channel, when we had about, or not this one, but our main channel with around 7,000 subscribers and we were making videos about our boardy skateboards. That to me was really dynamic. I thought that was really interesting. Like that we had an actual physical product and we were building a brand out of like thin air for a physical thing that exists and people could have in their homes. And people still have in their homes. I, I still people think People still that, ride them. I told you that this morning, I still think that was one of the best ideas we've ever had. Uh, primarily because again, YouTube as an engine where it's an engine to build something. Yeah. Not uh, only do I think it was one of our best ideas, but I actually think it was one of the m- more enjoyable ideas for me and who <laughs> I'm suited to be. Right. Like the type of company I thought I would be right. involved with. Yeah, I agree. I, yeah. I, I think same with me. I, I, I think back to that time, I think we were just like too scattered to know exactly what we were doing at that time. But that was like a, a really dynamic thing to build a product like that, a unique product that was associated with a YouTube show. That was super cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think the, uh, the tangibility of what you're doing on YouTube is so important. 
Cause like you have to see, you have to see it. And with the lacrosse network, although it was intangible, uh, it, it did become very real when we went to events. We went to events, like there was thousands of kids who were watching us, who were interacting with us. We were signing autographs, shaking hands. We were on TV. We were on TV, but like seeing the people who are watching your channel and that rarely happens with us, which I think is what changes the environment. A lot of times, I think Peter McKinnon said this one time, like being a YouTuber, you're sitting, uh, it's like you and me sitting in a car filming ourselves, sitting here in the office, looking at ourselves, editing ourselves, pressing publish, sitting here still with ourselves and people are commenting and you're seeing the, the feedback loop, but you're not actually interacting with it at all. There's not, not like a, a tangible community outside of like typing. And so like everything happens in this room right now, especially during this 2020 year where we can't do anything else. Like yeah. all of it happens in here. <laughs> like it doesn't, you don't feel the, uh, the energy of people enjoying your content, you know, in the same way. Totally. And that's, that's a huge difference. The feedback loop is huge. Um, like to have that level of, of interaction with the person who's yeah. being impacted by your content. I would love for our channel to be the best marketing arm for some sort of product or company. Yeah, I agree with that. So then I understand like every upload is so intentional. Mm -hmm. and, and I think, I mean, at the core of it, what we're talking about is like the difference between the advertising business and, you know, the marketing business. Marketing meaning marketing your own product, advertising meaning advertising someone else's product. Like, I think that's the, the core of what we're talking about is uh, you, you, as any good creator, um, you want a healthy mix of both. Not only because it's good for business, but it's also good for your like mental space that you're, you always have something that if you do feel like you need to step away from creating for a while and you do want to get re-inspired, um, it's not like you're in your mind, you're like, whoa, we're going to lose money if I do that. Mm -hmm. That relationship changes everything. I think the longevity of a creative career relies on the diversification of your revenue streams, both because of the business aspect, but also because of your ability to not burn out. Yeah. You know, your ability to not be just so reliant on the algorithm to pay your bills. And um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I could see myself having a lot of energy helping other creators develop physical products and tangible goods. Right like doing what we did with the skateboard, but for yeah, a creator yeah. who it's right for them to be making that type of good or helping them develop a book, like a physical book that could be on someone's coffee table. I think that's interesting. Yeah, I agree with that. I think, I think just even the more and more we talk about how exciting that element of being creators is, the more and more it interests me of like, just it's so exciting that creators can do that. What's also exciting is the amount of people who watch this podcast and then offer to send us coffee. That <laughs> yeah, is, we're, that's amazing. That is one of the most exciting things in the world. It's just like, we have so much coffee coming here right now and it's great. <laughs> we don't have a coffee maker. Not yet, but there, there's two things that are going to happen that I'm going to predict. Coffee sponsor and pasta sponsor. Those are the two things that I think are going to happen in the next 12 months. And if those happen, forget the rest of this podcast. Everything else I said... <laughs> I'll make videos for a coffee and pasta sponsor. Coffee and pasta. <laughs> All right. Well, we just wanted to open up and, and talk about that because it's conversations that we have in here. And a lot of times you don't hear as much um, behind the scenes of creators talking about, you know, what, what is going on in their heads about, about how long they can do this for. Like what is, what is happening in, in a creator's head? And I was inspired by uh, listening to other creators talk about it and having, having them talk about it normalized it for me hearing them talk about the fact that, you know, Zane talks about how he has 4 million subscribers and he's feeling not that inspired to post for those people right now and to post on that channel because, you know, he wants to make different types of content. And he was talking about that that's why people make second channels. And I thought that was a really interesting concept. Uh, it ties in with, you know, the direction of, of where our lives are going and just an interesting conversation to continue to have and to continue to check in, not only with ourselves, but to check in with all of you guys who are listening. Um, you know, just like, where are you in your career? And like, where are you 100%? You know, are you feeling like this is, what, what changes can you make to make sure that it's diversified enough to not put so much pressure on you? Yeah. I think one of the best questions you can ask is how do you want to spend your day? Yeah. Like what is an ideal day for you? Because it's a difficult to question, but if you continue to think about it, you can look at your day a little bit differently and try and recognize when you're really enjoying something and go, all right, I should take note of this. Mm -hmm. That's something to include in my perfect day.
I think the way we can end this this podcast right now is to say all of you guys who are listening, especially if you made it to the end of this episode, um, comment your perfect day in the comments. It'd be so fun to read what everyone's perspective is on like what makes a perfect day for them. That is That would be so cool. That would be interesting. So, Put that in the comments. Make sure to like the video. Subscribe to the channel. We got more podcasts coming out. Uh, and that is it. Next time I'm on this podcast, I will be a married man. Whoa. Whoa.